Hi, my name is Miranda Wright, and this is day 31 of our 120-day Upper Room Prayer Campaign. And today we're going to pray a prayer of forgiveness. Did you know that biblically there are several things that will cause God to not hear our prayers? Again, this is why it's so important to couple teaching with prayer, because without understanding, we will do nothing but waste time, energy, and resources praying ineffective prayers. One of those things that we've touched on before is praying outside the will of God because the scripture says that if we pray anything according to his will, he will hear us. Again, emphasizing the importance of why we first lay out the word of God, knowing that it shows us his will so that we can pray in agreement with it and have effectual, fervent prayers. Of course, another obvious hindrance to our prayers is sin. The Bible says that God's arm is not short, that he cannot reach. But because your sins have separated you from your God, he will not hear your prayer. So when a person sins, they have to come to that place of repentance first, get back in alignment with God's word and God's will before their prayers will even be heard. In fact, in another passage, it clearly and specifically says, for we knoweth that God doth not heareth sinners. So my friend, if you know that you are in sin, fall on your face and repent that you might once again be able to enter in. The Bible says if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive. We must confess them to him as sins that we recognize that it was wrong, out of agreement and out of alignment with his word and his will and repent of it. Turn away from it. Return to it no more. Then will he hear from heaven. Then will he answer our prayers. There are other things, and we will cover that at another time, but specifically the one that I want to address today, that is a hindrance to prayer. Actually, it's a hindrance to your very salvation, is unforgiveness. We have no excuse to hold on to bitterness, hatred, or unforgiveness to any man. And that old voice in your ear will tell you, oh, but they don't know what they did to you. My friend, what they did to you cannot compare to what we did to Christ. Christ did nothing but love. He never sinned. He never did anything wrong to any man. He was completely innocent, a spotless lamb. He was love incarnate, and yet he was despised and rejected, hated by men, scorned, cursed, mocked, ridiculed, spat upon. They ripped his beard out of his face. They pressed thorns into his head. They beat him raw and ripped the flesh from his body, leaving his bones exposed. They beat him so sorely that the Bible says that he was not even recognizable as a man. And then they nailed him to a cross. And as he was on that cross, literally suffocating under the weight of his own body, pulling down, unable to breathe and catch his breath, bleeding, wounded, ripped raw. And then they offer him a sponge full of vinegar pressed to his face, already unable to breathe, gasping for breath, burning the open wounds on his flesh, all while yelling, crucify him. He thinks he's the king. That's the suffering our Christ endured. And yet even in the midst of it, He gathered up the last bit of breath he had to utter forth those words, his final prayer, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. And then they pierced his side. Don't tell me you have a right to not forgive because of what they did to you. Jesus came to be our example. To show us the way of salvation. In fact, in Jesus' prayer to the Father in John 17, he says that he sanctified himself so that we might sanctify ourselves. In other words, he lived the example so that we might follow it. To show us what is humility and love exemplified, that we might have a pattern and walk in it. There's a reason, my friend, that you have to forgive. It is a choice, but it's not an option. If you want to be saved, if you want to be counted as a child of God, if you want to get into heaven and avoid hell, you have to forgive 
everyone. You cannot hold on to offense. You cannot hold in to grudges. You cannot hold on to bitterness. You cannot hold on to racism. You cannot hold on to hatred. It doesn't matter who it is. It doesn't matter what they've done. You must forgive. In Matthew 6, when the disciples said, Lord, teach us how to pray. And the Lord gave us that perfect pattern prayer. Though he says, do not pray in vain repetition, but I will show you what a perfect prayer sounds like. He gave us the Our Father. And within that prayer, he positioned a petition for forgiveness in union with a declaration of forgiveness. In Matthew chapter 6, verse 12, he says, in the Our Father, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Or some translations might say, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who have trespassed against us. Because if you jump down to the bottom of the prayer in verse 14, Jesus says this, for if ye forgive men their trespasses or their sins against you, your heavenly father will also forgive you of your sins against him. But if you forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your father forgive you yours. My friend, when you listen to that voice of the enemy and decide to hold on to offense, to bitterness, to hatred, to racism, to victimism, to unforgiveness of any time, you forfeit your salvation. That's very hard, but that's very true. And I know in your heart that you're saying no. There's no way that just being mad at somebody can really steal your salvation away and send your soul to hell. There's no way. That's not possible. My friend, so serious is this sin and such an effective trap of the enemy is it that Jesus left no room for interpretation. He made it very plain and very clear and demonstrated it with his own life. What he endured was to assure that you understood that no matter what, you must forgive. In Matthew 18, verse 21, Jesus gives us these words in the form of a parable. He says, Then Peter came to him, came to Jesus, and said, Lord, how oft shall my brother sin against me, and I forgive him? Till seven times? Jesus saith unto him, I say not unto thee until seven times but until seventy times seventy. Therefore is the kingdom of heaven likened unto a certain king, which would take account of his servants, of course that king representing God, who is keeping an eye on his servants. And when he had began to reckon, one was brought unto him, which owed him ten thousand talents, which equated to an unpayable debt. The amount was too high for this servant to ever even imagine that he would be able to pay. But for as much as he had not to pay, his Lord commanded him to be sold and his wife and children and all that he had and payment to be made. In other words, he had a debt he could not pay. Therefore, the penalty of it was that he would be sold to a cruel master. You see, the Bible says that the wages of our sin is death. And when we sin, we become the servant of sin and Satan becomes our master. He is a cruel master master but the parable continues he says the servant therefore fell down and worshiped him the response is always worship saying lord have patience with me and i will pay thee all oh don't we make bargains with god don't we tell him we'll fix it we'll make it better we'll earn our way back we can do it then the lord of that servant was moved with compassion and loosed him and forgave him his debt So the master realized he cannot pay this, but I am moved that he wants to. And so I will forgive his debt. When we come before God and we cry out for mercy and we tell him that we are sorry for those sins we want to do better, he knows that we don't have the ability in ourselves to do it. But moved with compassion, he wipes the debt clean and gives us the ability to walk free from it. So this man is forgiven. His debt has been paid by the blood of Jesus Christ. He is clean and set free. He has a fresh start. He is saved. He is born again. 
but something happens because the parable continues and it says, but the same servant went out and found one of his fellow servants, which owed him a hundred pence, which was like almost nothing compared to what he owed the master that had been forgiven. And he laid hands on this servant and took him by the throat saying, pay me that thou owest. And his fellow servant fell down at his feet and besought him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will repay thee all. And he would not, but went and cast him into prison till he should pay the debt. In other words, this person who is blood-bought, born again, saved child of the king, set free, purchased by the blood, they saw another servant who owed him a debt, someone who had sinned against him. And though the sin against him could not even compare to what the master had paid to release him from his debt, he still chose to hold on to that debt. What he had freely been given, he did not freely give out. He did not forgive, though he had been forgiven. So when his fellow servants saw what he had done, they were very sorry and told unto their Lord all that was done. Then his Lord, after that he had called him, said unto him, O thou wicked servant, I forgave thee all that debt, because thou desired me. Shouldest not thou also have had compassion on thy fellow servant, even as I had pity on thee? And his Lord was wroth, and delivered him to the tormentors, till he should pay all that was due unto him. So likewise shall my heavenly Father do also unto you, if ye from your heart forgive not every one his brother their trespasses. Do you understand what happened here? He was thrown to the tormentors. He was put in jail. Oh no, he's talking about you being thrown into hell. Because it says that he was put there until the debt was paid, and this was a debt this man could not pay. My friend, yes, it is that serious. A saved, blood-bought, born-again, purchased child of God will lose their salvation and earn hell if they do not forgive their brothers. My friend, I don't care what your preacher's been preaching to you calling themselves a preacher. The Bible says, blessed are the peacemakers. And then if they're not preaching to you the truth, then they are not men of God. They are ministers of Satan preaching doctrines of demons that will send your soul to hell because the word of God is sure. It is true. It is a buckler to all those who trust in it and it will save your soul if you choose to believe in it. And the words of Jesus Christ himself, God in the flesh says that if you do not forgive, you cannot be forgiven. You will not go to heaven. Even Paul himself said, I, even I, after that I have preached to all of you, if I do not put my body into subjection, even I would be a castaway. My friends, you can lose your prayer life more than that. You can lose salvation and unforgiveness is one of the ways you can. I'm giving you the word of the living God. It's your choice to believe it, receive it, or reject it and suffer the consequences of it. But today we've got to make a choice. We've got to pray for a heart of forgiveness. We've got to forgive some people. We've got to forgive some circumstances. And some people even need to forgive God because things didn't go the way that they thought that they should have because it's hindered you. It's blocked your prayer life and it's blocked your connection to the king himself. It's caused you to walk in rebellion. It's caused you to walk in offense. It's caused you to walk in hatred and bitterness that the Bible actually says brings rottenness to your bones so that it literally brings upon you cancers and crippling sicknesses. It gives the enemy access. I'm telling you, my friends, this thing goes so deep. That's why... Jesus endured so much to give us an example to take away our excuse so that we would have no excuse but to say, I can forgive. He showed me the way. We can say, Father, forgive them. They don't even know what they're doing. Because let me tell you something, my friend. The Bible says we fight not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, and rulers in dark places. And we need to learn as the body of Christ how to separate the person from the spirit that is controlling the person. And we need to start loving the person and feeling sorry for the person and getting angry at the spirit. Stop cursing the person. Start warring against the spirit and love the soul of the person enough to want to save them from it. But to do that, you have to forgive. In Matthew 5, 25, Jesus tells us this. 
Ye have heard that it was said of them of old time, Thou shalt not kill, but whoever shall kill shall be in danger of the judgment. But I say unto you, in other words, he's saying that was Old Testament, that was pretty rough. But what I'm saying to you is going to take it a step further. But I say unto you that whosoever is even just angry at his brother without a cause is in danger of the judgment. Now, it doesn't say being angry will send you to hell, but it does say that it puts you in danger of going to hell. Because once that anger rises up in you, you've got to make a choice to put the flesh into subjection and forgive. And whosoever shall say to his brother, Raka, shall be in danger of the council. But whosoever shall say, thou fool, shall be in danger of hell fire. In other words, whoever shall speak forth with bitterness, anger, aggression, unforgiveness, whoever shall let the hatred in their heart come out of their mouth is actually cursing someone. That's where we get the term using a curse word. According to God, you are literally releasing a curse anytime any words are spoken out of your mouth directed towards a person from a root of bitterness, hatred, anger, or unforgiveness. He said, and anyone who does this is in danger of hell fire. Therefore, if thou bring thy gift to the altar and there you remember that thy brother hath aught against thee, leave there thy gift before the altar and go thy way. First be reconciled to thy brother and then come and offer thy gift. Do you understand that Jesus himself is saying, don't even try to bring an offering to the Lord. Don't bring an offering of prayer. Don't bring an offering of praise. Don't bring an offering of finance. Don't raise your hands before the Lord when you still have hatred in your heart for your brother because it's pointless. He's not even hearing that. You're wasting your time, your effort, and your energy. You need to first go and reconcile yourself to your brother. Make sure that you get that offense out of you, that hatred out of you, that unforgiveness, and forgive, and then come back and offer your praises unto the Lord because until you do that, he's not even hearing you. It's pointless. It's not real. It's just a show. It's pharmaceutical. It's counterfeit. So we have to ask ourselves, why? Why is simply being mad at someone so vile in God's eyes? How can it cost me my salvation? I don't understand the mechanics of this. Some people are very analytical. You know, we have to be able to take things by faith in the scripture, but some people are very analytical and they want it to be explained. So let me show you, God does explain it. Because when you become angry at someone, when you choose to hold that offense, the voice of the Holy Spirit is telling you, you've got to forgive and let it go because I am love. But there's another voice in your ear telling you, no, you didn't deserve that. No, walk in your pride, walk in your arrogance. You're better than that. They should never have done those things to you. You deserve. Walk in your woundedness. Walk in your victim mentality and I will keep using it to my advantage. To gain access. To get you to agree with me. To get you to listen to that other voice. And to let him in. Remember that Jesus stands at the door and knock. But according to what God said to Cain, so does the devil. Who are you going to open it to? If you choose to forgive. And pray for those who persecute you, despise you, hurt you, and despitefully use you. You humble yourself and open the door to Christ. But when you choose to hold on to anger, hatred, offense, bitterness, and unforgiveness, you do what Cain did. You open it to the devil and you let him in. It gives the devil place. Ephesians 4.24 tells us, Put on the new man which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Be angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath, neither give place to the devil. It's right there. It's plain as day. We will get angry. We have emotions. Things will rise up in us in a moment, but you need to take authority and control over that right then and there and deal with it. The Bible says, yes, be angry, but do not sin. Don't let the sun go down upon that wrath. You got to let it go. You can't hold on to it. Before the sun goes down that day, you need to forgive them and move on or else you give place 
to the devil. This is why, after all that had been done to him, before the sun went down that day, before Jesus closed his eyes, before he let go of that last breath and went on to eternity, he had to let it go. He had to pray that prayer, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Because he was going to be our sacrificial lamb. He was going to be our atoning sacrifice. He was going to be the first man ever to live and die without sin, that he might enter in and bring the blood of that atonement to the mercy seat of God to the very throne of God himself because no sin or flesh can enter heaven and no man had lived without sin therefore could no one bring an offering in but this man Jesus Christ he was going to do it but the only way he could do it in all purity and perfection and alignment with the word and will of God is if he made sure that the son did not go down upon his wrath he had to forgive them yes we're going to get angry Yes, things are going to happen to us. Yes, the devil's going to say things in our ears that might even rile our flesh. But we've got to choose to reject what he says. Come into agreement with what the Holy Spirit says. Put the flesh into subjection and say, no, it's not their fault. They are being led of another spirit. And I will not allow myself to do the same. Father, forgive them. They don't realize what they're doing. Because if you do, then you continue to be led of the Holy Spirit of the living God. And you continue to pray for them that their soul might be saved, that you both may enter into the kingdom. But if you don't, then you allow that other person who is led of that other spirit to cause you to come in agreement with that same spirit and be led of that spirit that you both be led straight to hell. You must forgive. My friend, forgiveness is not so much for the other person as it is for you. It releases you. It lets you go from the burden because very often the other person doesn't even know and is not affected by the anger that you're holding on to, by the thoughts that you're allowing the enemy to, to put in your head, to torment your, your soul. You need to say to that devil, I don't agree with you. They don't know what they're doing. Lord, save their soul. You get behind me, Satan. You have no place here. Because you see, in the book of Hebrews, it explains that in the Old Testament, God showed Moses what heaven looks like and then gave Moses instructions on how to build a small scale replica to create the tabernacle that God's presence would then come in and dwell. And that tells us something very important about the character of God, that God wants to indwell a place that is the most like heaven as possible. And so now we've got to recognize that if we are the temples of the New Testament, that in order for that same Holy Spirit, the presence of God to come in and indwell our temple, we've got to make our temple as much like heaven as possible. And my friend, there is no bitterness, hatred, envy, strife, or unforgiveness in heaven. You've got to cleanse your hands, ye sinner, and purify your heart so that the King of glory can enter in. Because he will not share his glory with another. And if you allow unforgiveness, hatred, offense, or envy to open the door to the devil, it will grieve the Holy Spirit and he will depart. And when those unclean spirits come back and find the house empty, he will return with seven more of his friends and the latter state of the man will be worse than the former. My friend, unforgiveness will steal your heart. It will steal your prayer life and it will steal your very salvation. It will damn your soul to hell. It's serious. So let us pray. Father, we pray a prayer of forgiveness today. God, we choose to forgive those who have come against us, who have persecuted us, who have hurt us, who have slandered us, who have lied against us, who have done all manner of evil and wickedness against us that ought not even be uttered in the company of men. Lord, we choose to forgive. They did not know what they were doing. They were led of that other spirit, and we choose today to not be led of it also, but to come into alignment and agreement with your word, with your spirit, with your direction, that our hands might be clean before you, that our hearts might be cleansed, and that you might enter in, and that we might be led of you and be called your children again. I'm going to allow for a moment of silence just for a short time and I want you to search your heart and if there's anyone that you know you need to forgive, then you need to pray that prayer. 
You need to say it. Say it where you can hear it. Say it where God can hear it and say it where the devil can hear it. Say, I forgive and say that name. I'm going to give you a moment. Search your heart all the way back to your childhood. Anything that you think might have a root of offense or bitterness in you that could rise up at some point in time, even if they're not around you presently. You don't have to go and search them out and tell them all the things that they did wrong because sometimes that can do more harm than good. They don't even know that you're offended. That can cause more offense sometimes unless the Lord leads you to do that. Of course, be obedient to the leading of the spirit. But I'm saying for you right here, right now, utter those words, I forgive and lay the name. And so now because the way we take territory is to start in our own camp and then expand outward, we're going to have to start very close and very personally and say, God, I forgive you. Lord, I humble myself to you and I repent because there are things that I expected that didn't go the way that I thought that they should go. There are things that you promised that didn't happen the way that I thought that they would happen. And sometimes we can allow offense against God himself to rise up in us because of those things. And we may not acknowledge it or even recognize it, but it will be a hindrance to our prayer life, to our power, and to our ability to hear God clearly. So if there be anything in your heart that you can say that didn't go the way that you thought it ought, and perhaps you may have offense against God himself for it, you need to repent of that. You need to lay that down. You need to acknowledge that he is God and I am not, and I will not hold offense anymore. Forgive me, my Lord. And now you need to forgive yourself. Because if the Lord hath forgiven you, there is no reason to dig up those old sins and those old guilts. My friend, you are putting your hands through the blood to pull up that which is dead and gone. And your hands will not be found clean. They will be found full of blood. So Lord, we forgive ourselves for the things that we have done in the past, for the times that we have failed you. We know that your word says that you know our frame and you remember that we are but dust and that if we confess our sins and our faults to you, that you are faithful and just to forgive. So from this moment on, we won't be plagued by the things of the past, by the mistakes or the mishaps. We lay it all down at the foot of the cross. We will not pick it up again. We worship you and we thank you that we are forgiven. And then we need to forgive those in our own household. Husbands and wives, this is very important because you know that the Bible says that if we don't honor our spouses as equal heirs of the grace of life, that God will not hear our prayers. So there's a twofold hindrance there that we must forgive them and we must honor them. So Lord, we pray that you would, so God, we forgive our spouses for the things they've said in the heat of the moment, for the things that they've done that didn't meet our expectation. God, we humble ourselves and lay down and make ourselves the servant in our relationship, the one that is willing to serve and to sacrifice because true love is sacrifice and then we need to forgive those in our household if it be parents to children if there's any offense between you and your family and your parents your your children no matter what the cause what the reason the bible says to honor thy father and thy mother for this is the first commandment with promise that you may live long and it shall be well with you and even if they did things wrong you still have to humble yourself and honor them or things will never be well with you. So today we say, if there be anything in those cases, then call that name out and say, I forgive you. And so then we expand out to extended family. And this can be a huge area where there can be a lot of offense. But I'm telling you, my friend, today you've got to lay it down or you forfeit your forgiveness from God and you damn your own soul to hell. Lay it down today. Pray those prayers, call those names, lay it before the Lord, make a choice and say, I forgive you. And so now we extend out to bring healing within the body of Christ because you're going to have to forgive the people in your church. Yes, there are people in the churches that succumbed to the leading of another spirit. 
Some of them children of the living God who in the heat of the moment or in offense listened to that other voice and said something or did something that hurts you. But you've got to choose to be the one willing to forgive. And sometimes, my friend, they were never even children of the kingdom. They were led of other spirits, children of hell sent in to infiltrate, to bring harm and hurt to the hearts of young converts. Those with that Jezebel spirit, those with that spirit of envy, those with that pharmaceutical spirit. There are wolves in sheep's clothing. There are those who were never saved that mingle among the herd just to bring hurt, to bring offense, to drive away and drag away. But today you choose to forgive and start to pray for them again. So you list those names out. If you've got to pause the podcast because the list is lengthy, then pause the podcast. But list those names out and say, today, I forgive. Now you need to expand it out to your larger circle, your workplace. Oh, that's that's a great opportunity for offense there. Bosses, teachers, classmates, old friends, exes. People from relationships that you were never called to be in. Don't be mad at that person because it didn't work out well. Be mad at yourself that you didn't seek the Lord first before you got involved in something you were never called to be in. Humble yourself. Repent. Forgive them and pray for them. List those names out now. And now we've got to take it even further. Because there are people and people groups that we've never met that we have not forgiven. So now I give you the opportunity to forgive political groups that have come in opposition, that have caused offense, harm and hurt. Doesn't mean that they're right. Means that you love them enough to forgive them so that you can have effective prayers to pray for them that their soul might be saved. We forgive Democrat, Republican, liberals, the feminist, the atheist, Religious groups, the Muslim, the Hindu, you name it. Whatever you have encountered in your life that may have planted a root of offense in you for them, you need to name it and forgive them. We do not agree with it, but we still have to forgive them and pray the prayer that Jesus prayed. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. We love them enough to lay down the bitterness To lay down the offense and to cry out for their soul. Because Jesus loved us enough when we were vile and wretched and part of the world to cry out for our forgiveness. That we might be saved from it and brought in to the family of God. And he expects us to do the same because the Bible says they will know that we are his by our love. Yes, we have to take a stand for holiness. We have to be set apart. We have to show a difference between the unholy and and the holy. We have to, like Christ, be an example to the world of that which is in agreement to the word of God. From that stance, we have to love those who are not in it and forgive them for their offenses against it and pray them in that they might be saved also. Because so once were all of you. Remember where you came from. That you might have a heart to help others to where you are. Father, we forgive them. And now we ask that you forgive us. In Jesus' name, amen.